Ooh, my phone. Okay, what's up, everybody? Aggie Out Loud. Um, just got off of work. It's about 8, 10 a.m. in the morning. I'm going to go ahead and try to finish this part two. Hopefully, my video won't cut out on me, my video recorder. Um, so, let's just jump right into it. I'm going to start off where I left off from the last video in the second part of part two. He looks through his binoculars and sure enough, it's the body of a little boy stuffed in a little opening in the rock. He recognizes the color of the kid's shirt so he knows right away that it's the missing boy. That's when he calls it in and we're dispatched. It took us almost an hour to get his body down and none of us could believe what we were seeing. Not only was this kid 15 miles miles from where he'd started there was no possible way he could have gotten up there on his own this slope is treacherous and it's even hard for us with our climbing gear a five-year-old boy had no way of getting up there of that i'm certain not only that but the kid doesn't have a scratch on him his shoes are gone but his feet aren't damaged or dirty so it wasn't as if an animal dragged him up there and from what we can tell he hasn't been dead that long he'd been out there for over a month by that point and it looked like he'd only been dead for at most a day or two the whole thing was unbelievably strange and was one of the most disconcerting calls i've ever been on we found out later that the coroner determined the kid had died from exposure he'd frozen to death probably late at night two days before we found him there were no suspects and no answers. To date, it's one of the weirdest things I've ever seen. One of my first jobs as a trainee was a search op for a four-year-old kid that had gotten separated from his mom. This was one of those cases where we knew we were going to find him because the dogs were on a strong scent trail and we saw clear signs that he was in the area. We ended up finding him in a berry patch about half a mile from where we'd seen him last. I'm sorry, from where he'd been last seen. Kid wasn't even aware that he'd wandered that far. One of the vets brought him back, which I was glad for because I'm really not good with kids and I find it hard to talk to them and keep them company. As my trainer and I are headed back, she decides to take me on a detour to show me one of the hot spots where we tend to find missing people. It's a natural dip in the land near a popular trail and people will usually move downhill because it's easier we hike out there it's a few miles away and we get there in about an hour or so as we're talking around the area and she's pointing out places that she's found people in the past in i see something in the distance now this area we're in is about eight miles from the main parking area though there's back roads you can take to get closer Though there are back roads you can take to get closer if you don't want to hike that far. But we're on state protected land, which means there can't be any kind of commercial or residential development out here. The most you'll ever see is a fire tower or makeshift shelter that homeless people think they can get away with building. But I can see from here that whatever this thing is has has strange edges and if there's one thing you learn quickly it's that nature rarely makes straight lines i pointed out but she doesn't say anything she just hangs back and lets me wander over and check it out i get within about 20 feet of it and all the hair on the back of my neck stands up it's a staircase so this goes back to those mysterious staircases in the middle of the effing woods. In the proper context, it would literally be the most benign thing ever. It's just a normal staircase with beige carpet and about 10 steps tall. But instead of being in a house where it obviously should be, it's out here in the middle of the woods. The sides aren't, car aren't carpeted, obviously, and I can see the wood it's made of. It's almost like a video game glitch where the house is filled to load completely and the stairs are the only thing visible. I stand there and it's like my brain is working over time to try and make sense of what I'm seeing. My trainer comes and stands next to me and she just stands there casually looking at it as if it's the least interesting thing in the world. I ask her what the F this thing is doing here and she just chuckles. Get used to it. Get used to it, rookie. You're going to see a lot of them. I start to move closer, but she grabs my arm hard. I casually, I casually wouldn't do that. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. She grabs my arm hard. 
I wouldn't do that, she says. Her voice is casual, but her grip is tight. And I just stand there looking at her. You're going to see them all the time, but don't go near them. Don't touch those steps. Don't go up the steps. Just ignore them. I start to ask her more about it, but something in the way she's looking at me kind of tells me that it's best if I don't. We end up moving on, and the subject doesn't come up again for the rest of my training. She was right, though. I'd say about every fifth call I go on, I end up running across a set of stairs. Sometimes they're relatively close to the path, maybe within two or three miles. Sometimes they're 20, 30 miles out, literally in the middle of absolutely nowhere. And I only find them during the broadest searches or on training weekends. The biggest I ever saw looked like they came out of a turn-of-the-century mansion and were at least 10 feet wide with steps leading up at least 15 or 20 feet. I've tried talking about it with people, but they just give me the same response my trainer did. It's normal. Don't worry about it. They're not a big deal, but don't go close to them and don't go up them. When trainees ask me about the steps or staircases now, I give them the same response. I don't really know what else to tell them. I'm really hoping someday I get a better answer, but it, but it hasn't happened yet. This is another one that was less spooky and more sad. A young man went missing late in winter when realistically no one should be going that far out onto the trails. We close a lot of them, but some remain open year round unless there's a whole lot of snow. We didn't opt for him, but we had about six feet of snow on the ground. It was an unusually heavy, snowy year, and we knew it wasn't likely that we'd find him until spring when the thaw came. Sure enough, when the first big thaw came, a hiker reported a body a little ways off the main trail. We found him at the base of a tree in a pile of melted snow. I knew right away what had happened, and it scared the living hell out of me. Most of you who ski or snowboard or spend any amount of time on a mountain will probably have guessed too. When snow falls, it doesn't collect as thick in the areas beneath the branches. It happens most with fir trees because they have a sort of closed umbrella shape. So what you end up with is a space around the base of a tree that's filled with a mixture of loose, powder, loose powdery snow, air, and branches. There's, they're called tree wells, and they're not immediately obvious if you don't know what you're looking for. We put up signs in the Welcome Center, big ones even, letting people know how dangerous they are. But every year that we get an unusual amount of snow, there's always at least one person that doesn't read them. So doesn't take the warning seriously, and we find out about it in the spring. My best guess is that this young man was hiking and got tired, or maybe a cramp from walking in the deep snow. He went to go sit at the base of the tree, not knowing that there was a tree well, and fell in. He got stuck with his feet up, and the surrounding snow caved in around him. Unable to free himself, he suffocated. It's called snow immersion suffocation, and it doesn't usually happen except in really deep snow. But if you get stuck in a weird position like this guy did, even six feet of snow can be lethal. What scared me the most was just imagining how he must have struggled. Upside down in the freezing cold, he didn't die quickly either. The snow would have formed a dense, heavy pile on top of him, and it would have been literally impossible to get out. As it got harder to breathe, he would have known what was happening. I can't even imagine what he was thinking in, in his last moments. A lot of my outdoorsy friends, I'm sorry, a lot, a lot of my less outdoorsy friends want to know if I've ever seen the goat man while I've been out on calls. Unfortunately, or I guess fortunately, I've never had anything quite like that happen. I guess the closest was the whole black eyed man thing, but I didn't see anything. However, there was one call where I had something kind of similar happen, but I'm not sure I'm willing to chalk it up to the goat man just yet. We'd gotten a report that an older woman had fainted along one of the trails and needed assistance getting back down to the main area. We hike up to where she's at, and her husband is just beside himself. He runs, well, I guess more jogs to us, and tells us that, that he has a little ways off the trail. 
that he was a little ways off the trail looking at something when his wife starts screaming behind him. He runs back to her and she's passed out on the trail. We get her on a backboard and as we're getting her down to the welcome center, she comes to and starts screaming again. I calm her down and ask her what happened. I can't remember verbatim what she said, but essentially what happened was this. She'd, she'd been waiting for her husband when she started hearing this really strange sound. She said it sounded sort of like a cat, but it was off somehow, and she couldn't quite figure out why. She went a little ahead to try and hear it better, and it sounded like it was coming closer. She said the closer it got, the more uneasy she was, until she finally figured out what was wrong. I do remember this next part because it was so weird that I don't think I could forget it even if I tried. It wasn't a cat, it was a man saying the word meow over and over. Just meow, meow, meow. But it wasn't a man. It couldn't have been because I've never heard a man make this voice make his voice buzz like that. I thought my hearing aid was going out, but it wasn't. I adjusted it and it still sounded all buzzy. It was awful. He was coming closer, but I couldn't see him. And the closer he got, the more scared I was. And the last thing I remember was a shape coming out of the trees. I guess that's when I fainted. Now, obviously, I'm a little a little perplexed at this point as to why a guy would be out in the effing woods chanting meow, meow at people. So once we get down the mountain, I tell my superior that I'm going to go search the area to see if I can find anything. He gives me the go-ahead, and I grab a radio and a hike back to where she fainted. I don't see anyone, so I keep going about a mile more. And when I head back, I go off the trail to see if I can figure out where she saw him coming from. It's almost sunset by this point, and I don't have any desire to be out at night alone, so I just sort of write it off and make a mental note to check it out again tomorrow. But as I'm headed back, I start to hear something in the distance. I stop and I'll call out for anyone in the immediate area to identify themselves. The sound didn't come closer or get louder, but it sounded exactly like a man saying, meow, meow. In this really odd monotone, as comical as it makes it, as comical as it makes it sound, it was almost like that guy on South Park Oh, that came out country. South Park on South Park with the electro larynx Ned. I go off the trail in the direction I think it's coming from, but I never seem to get closer. It's almost like it's coming from all directions. Eventually, it just sort of fades out, and I ended up going back to the Welcome Center. I didn't get any further reports like that, and even though I went back to that area, I never heard that exact sound again. I suppose it could have been some stupid kid out there effing with people, but even I have to admit, it was weird. This is the end of part two. Thank God my video recorder didn't shut off on me. Look forward to part three. I'm telling y'all, these stories get even weirder. I just had to get through part one and part two. Aggie out loud. Leave a comment below. I love each and every one of y'all. And I just want to say thank you for all of the prayers about my sister. She is still in the hospital. It is serious. Um, and I just appreciate all of the kind comments and for all of the prayers. Please keep you, you. Please keep her in your prayers. Her name is Tara. And I love y'all. And I will do part three later on today. Look for it. I'm out. Peace.